Hey everyone, Mr. Denton here, continuing on our journey through the Constitution. Today we're going to look at Article 3, last of the major articles of the Constitution that deals with a branch of government, this one dealing with the judicial branch. Okay, so we're going to look at, at least at the beginning today. We'll go ahead and get rolling here. Um, so an overview of Article 3, said, covers the judicial branch, um, most notably the Supreme Court, but also, extremely important, the district courts and these appeals courts, which are our part of our federal court system. Primary purpose of the judicial branch can really be broken into three parts, but uh, two of those are very closely related, those first two there. Determining whether or not a law has been broken and then uh, if it has uh, the necessary punishment for breaking that law, um, and then also how to provide relief to those who have been harmed in the eyes of the law. That last one there um, um, happens a lot obviously at the Supreme Court level, but it happens at other levels of our federal courts as well. Determining the meaning of a law, interpreting a law, and whether or not that law is constitutional, and then also interpreting um, uh, the Constitution itself. Uh, and that comes up, um, you know, especially with very controversial topics uh, when our court system uh, has to go back and look at the language in the Constitution that was written hundreds of years ago and try to understand the best they can what was in the minds of the founders when they were writing the Constitution or the, you know, things along those lines, okay? Um, so we'll come back to that later on. For that reason, and it is, that's obviously, it's very, it's pretty heavy stuff, very complicated. Um, the judicial branch um, is a very mysterious branch and hard to understand for a lot of Americans. Um, and some of that's by design, too. Um, you can see down there at the bottom that in many ways, Judges are the referees in our democracy, and just like referees in a basketball game, those guys aren't out getting interviewed after the game. They're not the stars. Um, usually, they're not in the news very much unless something controversial happens or something goes wrong, and that's kind of the way it is uh, for judges as well. Um, and so th these guys try to stay out of the limelight. They try to be above politics, and a lot of, especially when you're talking about the Supreme Court, a lot of that stuff is done behind closed doors and and, and they're talking about, like I said, big complicated things that are at times hard for the average American to understand. Um, but it is a co-equal branch of government. It's extremely important um, uh, to our democracy, and so we're going to try to do our best to uh, understand it. Um, so um, we do have a dual court system, and what that means is, is that We've got state courts and we've got federal courts, just like, you know, all of our other branches of government. Um, but I'd say especially so our court system, they, you know, at the state and the federal level, they work side by side. Um, they both can feed directly to the Supreme Court, uh, which is a process we can talk about a little bit more later on. Um, and at times they have a jurisdiction that overlaps. Um, so you can see there uh, how things are broken down. Uh, and it's important to note that this is kind of generic over on the right hand side state courts um, that that system in each state varies from state to state we'll look at that a little bit more when we uh, we talk about Illinois later okay important thing there all judges serve life terms okay and there are no formal qualifications uh, we'll hit this again here in a minute but um, you know it's that's a, the, the top one there obviously is super important um, the fact that our judges um, don't have term limits or anything like that. When they are appointed, they serve for life. Okay, we'll come back to that a little bit later on. Um, so federal judges are not elected, okay, at the state level, because you might be wondering if some of you guys have already went out and voted that you may have, uh, you know, cast your vote for someone who was running uh, for, you know, for uh, some position in the justice system as a judge, but uh, at the federal level, that's not the case, okay? Um, judges are appointed, and they are all appointed by the president, okay? Um, so that's nine Supreme Court justices between the district and appellate level, somewhere in the vicinity of 850 other judges serve, um, and that fluctuates, uh, but um, important to know too, like I said, that all these folks serve life terms. So it's not like a president comes in and appoints 900 new people every four years, but over the course of a term of a presidency, it's likely that they are going to appoint hundreds of 
new judges. And this is seen as one of the biggest, most influential powers that a president has is getting to appoint all these judges, especially if they get to appoint, you know, one or more Supreme Court justices, because those people are so important and so influential and have have a ton of power. Okay. I mean, so the ability to choose someone that's in line with what you want, that's a, that's a, that's a big deal. Um, so and that's, like I said, also another example of checks and balances, um, as well. Okay. The branches powers overlapping and things like that. Qualifications to be a Supreme court justice, um, or any federal judge. There are none. There are no formal qualifications. Um, that having said that, um, there are expectations. And if you get appointed by the president, um, as, you know, like I said, a Supreme Court justice or any other federal uh, position uh, within the court system, and you don't have, you know, a legal background, you don't have legal expertise, you're not recognized as someone who has, um, you know, experience and has the right, um, you know, abilities and, and all those things, then you're probably not going to get appointed. Just like every other thing that the president gets to um, appoint, um, the the uh, Senate has to has to approve. And so, if the president appoints someone who's not going to get approved, well, then they're going to have to come back and appoint someone else. So it's it's pretty unlikely that someone is going to get appointed or approved if they don't have certain qualifications. Most of the time, though, when someone gets appointed, even though, yes, they are supposed to be above politics, justice is supposed to be blind, um, most of the time, judges have a some sort of political leanings in their background, okay? And usually tied in with that, they have some sort of judicial philosophy. So there are those judges who are what you might call activist judges, that they are going to go out and they see their role as a judge as someone who needs to point the country in the right direction based on the constitution. Maybe they think that the constitution has, um, you know, needs to be broadened or expanded. The powers that are out there for the government need to be broadened or whatever the case may be. And they try to steer things in that direction with the decisions that they make. Other judges believe in a very fundamental view that if something is not spelled out in the constitution, then, um, you know, that's it. That's all there is to it. Um, and, they, those judges try to keep as close to the original language and, you know, not read between the lines and things like that. So um, when a president appoints a, uh, a justice, um, usually party, some sort of political leanings and um, judicial philosophy play into that. Uh, like I said, the Senate has to approve um, any of these justices that get, uh, that, that get nominated by the president. They have to be confirmed uh, to be able to take that position. Okay, we'll skip past that. Uh, compensation, um, it, it's pretty much in line with what you see, although these folks make quite a bit of money, and uh, on top of that, they are there for life. Unless they get impeached, uh, unless they are removed by Congress, um, judges are there for life. Now, just take a quick second and talk about why that is. Um and here, I mean, justice is supposed to be blind. These guys are supposed to play referee and they're not supposed to pick favorites. They're not. So therefore we don't want these guys worried about, um, what, you know, the president or a certain congressman or really anybody else thinks we want them to, uh, just be beholden to the law and what it says and make the best decision that they can make based off of those things. And that's it. And not worried about getting reelected, not worrying about getting fired or any of those things. Um, they, they, we just want them to be completely impartial and be blind to everything, but the law itself and to justice. Um, so some people would argue that life is just too daggone long though, and that maybe they should be there for 10 years. And then if they're there for 10 years, they won't have to worry about most of those things and they can still be pretty impartial. Um, but Hey, it's, this is what's in the constitution and don't expect them to see, expect to see that going away, uh, anytime soon. Um, again, these folks are massively influential. They, they can, um, you know, 
have as much power as Congress in many ways uh, because they can strike down laws. Um, they can, and, you know, uh, hear cases and interpret the Constitution and make massive decisions that echo for decades or centuries. Um, and so it's it's really a uh, you know I mean it's a huge responsibility. It's a sacred responsibility in many ways. Um, you know I mean the Supreme Court is meant to look like a temple, um, and that's for I mean it's very intentional that uh, more than any other branch of government that it's almost like I mean it's a sacred almost kind of a spiritual thing. It is a belief in justice, and it's um, supposed to be above everything else when it comes to America. America is supposed to be a nation of laws and these guys are all about the law. Um, and they are, they take their job pretty seriously, very seriously, as seriously as you can possibly take it. Um, and, and, you know, so it's, it's seen as a huge deal to be appointed to one of these positions. Um, and so when, what I'm getting around to is that these folks don't necessarily do it for the money. Um, they're there, uh, because of the responsibility, the influence, etc. Okay, I told you this is going to be short. This is the last thing we'll look at here. Typically, uh, you know, we talked about the president and uh, Congress. We were looking at powers of those branches. So when you talk about power of the courts, you're really looking at what is called jurisdiction. Okay, and that means the power to hear certain types of cases. Um, and there's four listed there, but I've got them color coded because. Uh, to me, the best way, the easiest way to understand these jurisdictions um, amounts to comparing or looking at them in pairs. All right. So uh, the first two there, exclusive and concurrent. What exclusive means is that one court has the power to hear a case and no other courts can't. Okay. So it can't be heard at a district court and at the, you know, somewhere in the state courts as well. Um, it has to, it has to go be filtered to one court in particular. Concurrent means that more than one court can take jurisdiction over the case. And, you know, that happens. Those There are kinds of cases, certain kinds of cases, um, where that takes place. And then whoever is, you know, representing, um, you know, the defendant or, or whoever, one of the parties in, in the, the trial, they're going to try to lobby to get to the court that they think is going to best uh, give them the best chance, okay, to be successful, okay. Then you have original and appellate jurisdiction, all right. Original jurisdiction is the power to hear a case for the first time, okay. Appellate jurisdiction means that it will basically has the right to hear a case after the original um, court heard it, and then they can appeal that decision. They can overrule that decision, um, so, um, you know, district courts would be typically fall under the line of original jurisdiction. Then we have what are called actually appellate courts that can overrule those decisions. And then obviously the Supreme Court uh, kind of has both of those things. They, there are cases that go straight to the Supreme Court. Um, if Congress is suing the President of the United States for documents or something along those lines, then that case is a case that would go straight to the Supreme Court. Um, but the Supreme Court, many of the cases that it hears are appellate cases. In other words, cases that have been, um, you know, that have been heard in lower courts, sometimes many, several different lower courts, and then they make their way all the way up to the Supreme Court. Um, so they have appellate power too. We're going to spend a lot more time looking at the Supreme Court and their process and, uh, you know, just things of that nature. Um, next time around. So um, I told you this was going to be short. Like I said, under 15 minutes here. Um, just make sure you submit this as soon as you get a chance. I hope you guys are doing well, staying safe. I will, uh, I'll talk to you soon.